It came with the early morning to our continent's coast. But the dreary gray of the Pacific Northwest kept from sight all but a brief, unnatural darkness. Farther east, expectant crowds began to gather, to huddle in rapt anticipation. Even beyond the path of totality, we paused, captivated for the moment by the strange gray light and the spectacle of our familiar provider in masquerade. For many, it was a day of pilgrimage, a day to seek some hallowed ground under clear skies, a day to share a fleeting glimpse of a phenomenon not to be repeated on our continent until the year 2017. It was a day, a day that would turn to night as we stared into the eerie twilight at what has been termed the greatest celestial spectacle visible from the planet Earth, a total eclipse of the sun. At the tone 15 hours, six minutes coordinated universal time. And I'm told all the pictures in the world don't convey the moving sensation of seeing a total solar eclipse with your own eyes. But that won't stop us from trying. Tonight, we will follow University of Minnesota geophysicist Edward P. Nye as he leads a scientific eclipse expedition to the tiny town of Bowbells, North Dakota. We call our program Journey into Darkness, and we'll get at it right after this. It's Wednesday, February 21st, in a grimy basement laboratory beneath the physics building on the University of Minnesota campus. A brainchild is put through its paces. The technology you're seeing here is new, part of the relatively young science of infrared astronomy. These are the people who make it work. Mike Merrill, a young computer specialist. Jim Stoddard, the engineer who redesigned part of their telescope's infrared sensor. Roy Pearson, the U of M machinist who built Stoddard's better mousetrap. And Al Knutson, the gray eagle, they call him, engineer and resident troubleshooter. In three days, all this paraphernalia will have to be torn down, reassembled, and retested somewhere in the vicinity of the tiny town of Bow Bells, North Dakota, a spot chosen purely by the heavenly coincidence that it lies smack on the center line of a total solar eclipse. It's a full-fledged scientific expedition, and like all expeditions, it has a leader. And this, unquestionably, is he. And after the eclipse is over, there's this huge brightness that you see because you're dark adapted very well. Regions Professor Edward P. Nye, recognized nationally as one of a handful who are still building the foundations of infrared astronomy the mastermind of that gadget that whirs and hums deep beneath the lecture hall. Ed Nye is no newcomer to science, nor to this business of eclipse expeditions. Twenty years ago today, he was planning his first. That was back in 1959 when Professor Nye looked like this. It has long been an astrophysical puzzle as to how this high chair of the solar corona is maintained. The mission then was to the Sahara Desert, deepest, darkest Africa. Under escort from the French Army, Dr. Nye's team arrived at a remote oasis populated only by bands of roving Bedouins. Native prisoners poured the concrete slab for Nye's telescope. It was here, over the martinis from the portable refrigerator, that Ed Nye cemented his friendship with one Athelstan Spillhouse, then dean of the university's Institute of Technology. Dr. Spillhouse had come as Ed's guest the moral support specialist throughout the 30 thirsty days they waited to study the corona of the eclipsed sun. All went perfectly that day in Africa, but 30 minutes after totality, when their film camera was packed away, a massive locust swarm filled the sky. Had it come half an hour earlier, 
months of preparation, their entire experiment would have been ruined. The memory of that locust swarm, a brush with a scientific disaster, would return at times to haunt Ed and I. Yeah, right now. <laughs> Not locusts this time, but clouds. It's Friday, time to leave for Bow Bells. And the weather report from the U of M's official meteorologist is not good. Well, Homer Mattis says it's 50-50, and he's kind of pessimistic, so I think we have a fair chance. Well, it'll be clear enough to really do a decent experiment, something else again. To begin with, the whole venture to North Dakota was put together on a shoestring. Grant money was tight. Nye even dipped into his own pocket to cover some expenses. Can I take a printer? Yeah, the uh, HP yeah. Parts of their gear were dredged from surplus bins. Some components are actually leftovers from Africa, like the camel, the telescope mount they call Agnes. No sooner had the Nye crew arrived in Bow Bells when they bade their wives farewell and drove off again, all very tight-lipped and mysterious. Hmm. Well, in the lobby of the only hotel in Bow Bells, a welcoming committee headed by civic-minded Viola Berg stood ready to divert the anticipated overflow of eclipsers. There's supposed to be a bus from Lincoln, Nebraska with 45, and then there's supposed to be somebody here from New York, New Jersey, Illinois, and Texas and Colorado. So we'll see what happens. Uh, the, the school is available, but the facilities there aren't quite as, at least they're not quite as soft, maybe. <laughs> For those select few of us are lucky enough to have reserved one of the hotel's 10 rooms, the accommodations were uh, uh, interesting. By Sunday morning, we discovered where our scientists had gone. Off to Lefty Schwein's implement shed, 10 miles north of town. Here they assembled their makeshift observatory. Ed had hoped to keep their exact location quiet. Mob scenes and careful research just don't mix. Meanwhile, Bow Bells was a beehive. We know it may not look like a beehive, but for Bow Bells, this is beehive. They were ready. Take the drugstore. Usually only serves coffee with choice of cream and sugar. Today, the Legion moms, coordinated by Viola Berg, put on a benefit caramel roll feast. The excitement caught on, and the Bobellians themselves could be found boning up on astronomy or demonstrating their personal techniques for viewing the coming spectrum. <laughs> but nowhere was the aura of excitement greater than around Bow Bell's guest of honor, Ed Nye. And to intensify matters, who should appear but Athelstan Spillhouse? Remember? Ed's African cohort? He's retired now, but still dabbling in things scholarly in and around our nation's capital. Yeah. Well, now, I bring you a hot flash from Washington. Jimmy, there's now Jimmy Carter beer. But they've improved on Billy beer. Billy beer was just ordinary beer in a billy can. Jimmy Carter beer is quite different. You open up the can, there's no head on it. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Spillhouse came here just to be at Ed Nye's side for this eclipse. Says he wouldn't have missed this reunion for anything. In the Sahara, the temperature was 113 degrees. 
130. Okay. Here it's minus 10. Those are about the limits of human endurance. <laughs> but at any limit, you still have martinis. Exactly. <laughs> Between reminiscences, the subject always turns to wishful weather predictions. Athelstan's official forecast, clear. Yes, if the wind shifts towards the north. But everyone here knows that's a suspicious pronouncement coming from the man in charge of moral support. Well, we are in an eclipse strategy meeting convening in my room with uh, uh, suitable... Martinis. Yeah, and no discussion of business until after the first martini. And then we'll get your report. Okay. And then, and then the, the, our meteorological brain trust will evaluate it. Uh, let's see, the first martini is due to be served at 3.20, and that's about four minutes. <laughs> The upper winds are now roughly in the same direction. They're Which way? It's from the it southwest. is breaking up up there, southwest. definitely. Yeah. Oh, I think Look it's going to be good. Yeah, I think it is too. Look, it's uh, this. this. Yeah, and that's basically west. Yeah. Which is yeah. which bodes well. Hell, this is going to be good. Yeah, well, with, with a little luck, it'll be good. Jeez. Listen, my mother's sitting home in Virginia praying. For three days, she's praying. There's going to be good weather. That's what I did. That's it. That's it every time. <laughs> The weather outlook is questionable at best, and there was never any grant money for multiple observing sites. Yet the crew kept going, and cheerfully at that. Ed Nye is a private man, unlikely to leave clues as to what makes him tick. The best way to look at Nye, we found, is from Athelstan Spillhouse's hotel room. I think Ed Nye has to have uh, the combination of things which are really... Uh, a preservation or an outgrowth of childish characteristics. Uh, first of all, curiosity. Secondly, a love of adventure. And thirdly, a great sense of humor. He's a prime experimenter. He's had up here, for instance, to improvise because he's been caught short on a lot of things. And the ability to improvise at the last minute is magnificent. I mean, some of the Millikan got the Nobel Prize for a very simple experiment that was done with extremely simple equipment. That's elegant in science. But Spillhouse says he sees a widespread devaluation of pure science in this country. And it all ties in, he says, with the short shrift given nigh by the bureaucratic holders of the federal purse strings. The kind of questions that are asked, well, what good is it studying the corona of the sun? Well, that's what Disraeli asked uh, uh, Faraday, what good is electricity? And Faraday said, well, someday you'll be taxing it. <laughs> Back at the garage, all is in readiness. Jim Stoddard empties the liquid helium from his special infrared sensor. And as their baby is tucked in for the night, a remarkable thing. The skies were clearing. Credit it to Spillhouse's mother-in-law on her knees in Virginia, or to Apple's own power of positive thinking, whatever the case. It was cause for celebration. I don't even think he's a member of the club. <laughs> well, I was, I was... Down the street, Viola Berg toiled on into the night, frying 1,300 pieces of chicken. And the town of Bowbell slept. Okay, Gary. day dawned bright and sunny. A slight veil of high cirrus clouds, but sunny. Right now, anybody in his right mind is preparing. The scene at Lefty Schwain's was practically a carnival. It was the moment everyone had waited for, but not without some reservation. Would that sheer coverlet of clouds shoot him down in the 11th hour? Damn locusts. <laughs> In a few moments, a shadow would swing over Lefty Schwain's farm. Dying sunlight would stream through mountains on the moon. Over ten seconds' time, the sky would dim a hundredfold, and a thousand logic circuits would sing in unison.
Nebraska went all right. Came back to zero. Now that was the practice. In a few minutes, we'll have the real thing. Okay. I bet you didn't know you were going to be on television tonight. I suspect that means everybody will be at their usual rapt attention. And uh, since uh, these guys and I have been living together for the last few days, and they know me best in my costume, <laughs> I better get in, into the part. Back in Minneapolis, uh, the old grind. But besides lecturing, Ed Nye has been spending most of his time sifting through the data from Bull Bells and trying to decide just how much the cloudy skies may have affected his experiment. If you've wondered all this time just what Ed Nye was doing up there in Bull Bells, you may be interested to know that his experiment has quite far-reaching implications, possibly shedding light on the very origins of our universe. What we believe is that the solar system has a cloud of dust which is spiraling in toward the sun and which originates from the breakup of nuclei of comets. And uh, that material in, in the comets is the most primitive primordial material in the solar nebula. Originating with the creation of the universe at the Big Bang, space dust is suspected to contain the key to all life but nobody knows for sure what that dust is made of. One way of finding out may be to measure how close it has to be to the sun before it burns up, giving off infrared radiation. Normally, such subtle radiation would be obscured by the sun's own heat, but not during an eclipse. Nye's special telescope was programmed to scan the sky near the sun along 10 separate square-shaped patterns. At set intervals, it would sample the intensity of infrared radiation and pass the information along to a computer. To make sure the radiation measured was really coming from near the sun and not from the sky or space in general, the telescope has a mirror that wobbles five times a second, constantly comparing radiation near the sun with that far away from it. Finally, in a sort of computerized connect the dots game, Nye hopes to draw a line around the sun where space dust is burning away someday use that information to ponder how the cosmos and mankind got here in the first place. One footnote for geography buffs curious about how Bull Bells got that funny name. It seems there was an English princess visiting southern Manitoba back about 1898. As a gesture of hospitality, she was apparently presented a railroad map and allowed to name what were then uh, just dots along the right-of-way. Although it was intended she name only Canadian towns, she went ahead and christened a few in the U.S. as well. Bull Bell's namesake is one of the poorer quarters of London, so-called because of a cathedral with bells suspended by oxbows. I'm Dave Moore. Now, there it is. Oh, boy. Yeah. Oh, smokes, look at her now. I'm telling you, normally we have quite a bit of wind here.